Right. So yeah. So I'm just curious to know how did how did the session go? Uh, I think there were about six six groups, uh, seven groups, and um, yeah. So uh, did everyone get to share? Um, was there anyone who did not have time to share? Okay. Um, so it looks like okay. I don't see any hands going up. So everybody got to share a little bit at least. Okay. Um, and uh, so yeah. So so the, the question that I wanted to ask was um, um, okay. You got to share a little bit. Now these are very superficial things, of course, about food and uh, you know what irritates you and um, etc. So um, so yeah. So maybe we can just ask from one group. Um, okay, how did it feel like? Was it uncomfortable to hear? You know, was it uncomfortable? Was it comfortable? Um, you know, to talk about these things. Uh, I just wanted to hear maybe one group, group one, breakout group one, um, your experience. Um, who was in breakout group one? Uh, Okay, I, I can't see the uh, any group. Probably you can you can just share. Um, was it comfortable, uncomfortable? Um, yeah, and then I'll ask for the question. So any group, anybody from one group, probably. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, Chris. Pastor? Okay, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yes, I think it was uh, it is quite comfortable. Um, in, you know, it sort of. Kind of, uh, you know, flowed quite well, and uh, you know, yeah, everyone was, everyone in the group, um, in my group was, um, you know, quite, uh, you know, keen to, you know, to share and you know, expand on 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 what they wanted to, you know, wanted to share. Okay. So in my group, there was um, say there was Maxon and um, Kennedy. Okay. And um, yeah, it flowed pretty well. In fact, we had some time after each each of us shared, and we started talking about something that uh, you know it's, has been in the in the news for some time, and just how it could impact any of us. And that is basically this uh, this incident that happened in the Oscar Awards. Mm. Uh, you know, where Will Smith went and slapped uh, uh, Chris Rock. So um, yeah, we just we we just felt that you know sometimes at our uh, um, at our uh, highest moment, uh, and it was actually mentioned by someone uh, in uh, one of the actors. Uh, you know, the devil can really uh, can really uh, you know, play a part in you know bringing everything back, bringing everything uh, you know to a, to a very uh, unpleasant and um, mm. uh, you know situation. Okay. So yeah. So we. So everyone we had, got to yeah share. Uh, that's fine. So so when we were talking about what is your weakness and what you need to work on um so how was it was it um you know for you personally chris like uh, did you feel that okay uh, do you feel any reservation any inhibitions about talking about it or uh... no actually mine mine was no, i didn't have any inhibitions it was mm. it's kind of a general sort of uh, you mm. know uh, kind of area that i need to work on Okay. And uh, I'm just to share with the group. It is basically about you know the dependence on God, uh, and having it you know trying to do that as you know as as much as possible. I mean we all want to achieve uh, you know achieve hundred percent, mm. but um, for me it's 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 you know sometimes even less than you know um, I mean much less than hundred percent. You know sort of you know you just get caught up in other stuff other stuff. Right. So uh, that is where uh, I think I have to work on. So yeah, I don't have any reservations uh, sharing that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Uh, any group where it was very silent? <sighs> There's uh, maybe one word answers and you just kept silent most of the time. Any Was any group like that? Yes. I don't think. Yeah, really? Okay. Have any, no, 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 silent, but it was like uh, they all they all spoke, but in very short because I... And I... Then we had at the time we, we had little time at the end, so we prayed for each other. Oh, nice! <laughs> we okay. Weaknesses and strengths to the Lord, and we seek His uh, uh, grace in all areas. So we had three four minutes at the end to pray also. Okay. So we all could share. We were, but yeah, we were comfortable. Okay. We were quite comfortable sharing with each other. 
Okay. Uh, two years now we are together in the classroom, <laughs> even though online, but we know each other like um, virtually. So probably we could share with each other. It was a good experience, Pastor. Very okay. nice. So, so what you were hearing were uh, new that you. This is information that you didn't know about the person. Was it like that for everyone, like in the group? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it was. Okay, okay, right. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Avani. Yeah. So the thing is this, you know, um, like we we don't have a you know this kind of a forced time where everybody will, okay share. So in in real life, I mean, you know, in a in a uh, work setting or ministry, or, uh, uh, we may or we may not. You know, we might have some workshops or you know we might have some uh, things like that. But but really, you know, as as life happens, as um, you know, the day-to-day -day things happen. Um, while we, well, these things would help. You know, it could be one-off events would, uh, that would help us understand the person, and also the other person to understand you. Um, but to really have this, uh, do this as uh, as part of your life. You know, to really do this, um, to to maybe ask questions to, and also to share about oneself in casual conversation. Okay, and uh, and this would really really help relate to another person. Okay, so when it comes to you know things like weaknesses, uh, you know uh, maybe you know we 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 could be guarded in certain things. Of course, we need to be discerning and choose what we need to, and depending on the on the context and the you know the the uh, I mean to the one to whom we are sharing, we need to know uh, you know can this person be trusted and so on. You know it's like um, uh, very personal uh, things so you know you just need to be discerning about that right um, yeah so this is something that would really help you know if if let's say in our lives we are not used to it you know, if, if we, we might be highly competent highly skilled um, and really good at what we do right but uh, you know when it comes to uh, uh, certain things when it comes to social um, I, I, I won't say social skills, but you know, when it comes to relating to people socially, uh, and maybe you know, we we struggle, right? So these are things that would really help us um, to to relate to people, to uh, to do well, uh, to to make ourselves approachable, uh, and also to uh, to um, uh, to build trust, right? To break down preconceived notions or prejudices or biases that people might have against us about us and uh, and build trust you know i remember uh, going on an outbound uh, training with um, with some of our senior managers in the last company that i worked for and uh, i mean this was a you know typical outbound training where there was this rappelling there was this hikes there was these shallow rivers uh, where we had to build our raft and uh, you know, it was almost impossible to stay afloat with all, you know, falling into water and all those things. And there was one zip line which we had to go across. Uh, you know, it was raining. It, this was one of the, you know, rainiest places uh, in the south. Um, so, uh, you know, in one of those coffee growing places. So, you know, we we had to kind of go across that and and things like that. You know, and learning from all that. Um, so we we were with some of the senior. Uh, managers and then I remember one of the uh, you know my reporting manager is pulling me aside and saying uh, hey you know uh, I had some uh, reservations some thoughts about you uh, when we started the whole thing now I mean he, he didn't say about you he said you know one had uh, certain mindsets about the, I know about you but that has changed you know that that is uh, that has really changed, and uh, it's you know now I once one can see you in a different light, and uh, I was glad for that. You know, it's just that that opportunity uh, gave us. I mean, that whole thing gave us an opportunity to interact and get to know one, one each other better, and that really helped. You know, uh, and I wish that okay that had happened during the course of our professional you know uh, life uh, or professional work day, uh, but. Yeah, obviously it didn't happen, so I was glad for that. Right, so it can really help. Okay, so if we and if especially if we as leaders, if we would think on these lines, okay, 
Okay. The other thing that we see is uh, is something called the foxhole principle, meaning that uh, you know uh, that your life is you know it's not something to be spent alone, right? When you have a friend, and the foxhole typically refers to a hole which is dug in the ground. It's an American term, uh, which uh, a hole. Uh, dug in the ground by a soldier to protect himself and there's a it's, it's a big enough for one person or at the most two and it's like a trench it's like i mean trenches would be a slightly bigger so it's like a dugout in the ground so uh, the soldier is is at uh, you know in a battle and protect oneself from the bullets or even if there was something you know um, some explosion nearby to protect oneself from the you know from the sh uh, shrapnel and the dirt so it's below the ground, of course. So, so that's the foxhole. So, so the foxhole principle is that uh, you know when you have a foxhole, it's for uh, it's for you and one one more person. So it's good to have uh, a friend in times of adversity. You know, it's too good to have uh, uh, a person whom you can trust in times of adversity. And uh, always we can do something to. Uh, you know, have that kind of relationship. And if you look at Proverbs 18 and verse 24, mm -hmm. it's a very, um, you know, a, a, a verse which which highlights a very important truth. It says, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So a man who has friends must himself be friendly in the sense, you know, I, uh, to ask that question, am I friendly with others, you know, rather than saying okay i have no friends uh, i have you know no one to complain you know, to complain in that manner uh, but really to check and see you know do i have am i friendly with others right when people uh, when people invite when people ask and say okay you know would you like to you know go out, go go together you know there's a group and then they and then we hold back for some reason right and uh, and so we need to check and see okay am i am i really friendly you know, because i i might come across as uh, someone who's uh, very distant very aloof and not wanting to you know be friendly so well you might have your reasons for doing that but um, but really you know when those opportunities are there to be uh, to be friendly to show yourself friendly which is what you are Right. And so that's 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 a scripture. And um, the second part of it is, of course, it says that uh, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know, a friend for seasons of adversity. I'm sure you know we all have experienced the goodness or the timely help of friends in seasons or in times of you know great difficulty and uh, the the stuff that they did, what they you know maybe something simple. You know, I, I always appreciate uh, appreciated uh, you know the uh, a friend who stays close by. Uh, you know, he's part of the church also. Um, when you know my my father passed away a year ago, and this was on the third of Jan January, um, yeah, last year. So, um, so when I like we heard in the evening, and uh, we had to travel about six hours from here from from bangalore to go to the house and uh, we heard the news probably uh, i think about six or uh, no, about eight or seven o'clock in the night uh, in the evening and by the time we left it was about eight and i remember this person just came home and uh, he didn't do anything he didn't do much uh, but this is what he did you know he knew that we were driving so he just went down to the car he just you know wiped the car he uh, took some newspapers, wiped the windshield clean, you know, made sure that there was water uh, in the dispenser to clean the windshield because it was uh, you know, on the highway and um, and made sure that the windshields were sparkling clean. And uh, and that's all, you know, there's no, uh, you know, great speech, uh, nothing. He just asked, okay, is there anything else that I can do? Do you want this thing? Um, do you want me to? You know, uh, 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 you know, uh, will you be okay driving on your own? Because this, I was just driving straight for seven hours. Um, will you be okay? I said, yeah. And it was first time I'm driving at night, um, through the night rather. So he, he, was, he was a little concerned. I said, no problem. No problem. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm quite sharp. Uh, I won't go fast. And and the thing is, his what he did was a great help. You know, in times of that difficulty, uh, it was a small action that he did. 
but it really you know it really meant a lot for for me for the family uh, he was just there in just a few minutes he was there he made sure he was there till we left and uh, and and that was it right i'm sure there you know there have been times like that when people stepped into your lives and said okay now we'll do that so there are people like that whom i can count uh, count on really and say okay this person will take care you know i can depend on uh, i can any time of the day or night you know i i can just call and they would help and it's great to have such friends and i remember one one time when uh, you know i'll just share this because it was um, we were in a all night prayer and there was um, uh, i i don't think we had phones mobile phones i i don't remember but we were in this all night prayer and um, we we suddenly realized that a friend's niece was uh, no uh, was stuck in a railway station and she the train got cancelled and she didn't know what to do you know you know anyone here so they uh, contacted arthi i think oh, probably we had phones she called arthi and said you know can we my wife said can you go pick her up and uh, he said hey we can't you know we were leading uh, we were part of the all night prayer and you know um, and obviously you know i'm leading there and then so i can't go so so who who do we check you know we called a friend and said you know can you go pick her up now he hasn't seen her he doesn't know anything about her we just said this is her name and she's uh, you know we, there's one place we said okay uh, let us stand there and can you just go and we didn't know what he was doing you know <laughs> what other responsibilities he had but he said yeah sure i'll do that okay and it was late at night and uh, it is uh, i think close to midnight or and then he went picked her up brought her dropped her home and you know so things like that when when you don't know you know where to go what to do a friend who helps in adversity so it's it's really good to have a friend and and that's the fox hole principle you know which really leads us to the next thing which means that um for us to be friendly yes that's a, that's a that's definitely a a starting point to to be able to have friends um the other thing is also to invest okay uh investment uh when we talk of talk about investment of course obviously we you know what comes to our mind is uh, money and uh, maybe uh investment in terms of shares or you know uh, other options maybe sh- short term long term deposits and and so on uh but really investing in relationships uh is key um for uh, developing again you know when it comes to with uh i mean sorry um uh winning with people when it comes to relating to people when it comes to leadership nurturing relationships okay so every anything that you want to nurture it's going to take effort right it's not automatic Uh, that's we wish it could be but it's not it's going to take effort it's going to take time and it's going to take energy right you put you're putting them effort so um especially when it comes to human relationship it is going to uh, uh, you know we we need to invest in order to nurture r- relationships okay so so let's um, let's look at um, uh, the video uh, I, i just want us to um, you know probably make notes as you watch this video uh by john c maxwell and he's talking about um relationships and investing in relationships okay um let me just play that in a bit just one second five people principles in the investment stage. Number 17. The gardening principle. The gardening principle says all relationships need cultivation. Samuel Butler said friendship is like money, easier made than kept. And the question I must ask myself, do I occasionally or continually cultivate my relationships? 
Let's look at some ways to keep cultivating important relationships. What does it mean to cultivate a relationship? Whether it's as a spouse, parent, or a friend, you can start to cultivate a healthy, growing relationship by focusing on the following six things. Number one, commitment. Researcher Dr. Kinsey observed, there may be nothing more important in a marriage than a determination that it shall persist. With such determination, individuals force themselves to adjust and to accept situations which would otherwise seem sufficient grounds for breakup. Scott Peck wrote a classic work on human psychology in the late 1970s called The Road Less Traveled. This book really marked my life. Since that time, he has offered ever-increasing insights from his lengthy practice as a psychiatrist, and one of his points involves laziness. Dr. Peck says, laziness is a contributing cause of evil, a primary cause of psychological illness, and the main reason that Americans are increasingly failing at human relationships. He notes that meaningful relationships require commitment and work. Those who are lazy are seldom willing to expend that kind of energy. Many marriage counselors would concur that laziness is the major cause for failure of marriages. Too often people know what needs to be done to restore relationship but won't put forth the effort. Relational sloth has become an epidemic that we must honestly address. Number two, to cultivate a relationship, communication. Number two is communication. Just the ability to have a system to communicate. One of the things that helped me and my wife, Margaret, is early in my marriage, what, what I would catch myself doing is I'd catch myself working all day, and when I'd come home, she'd say, well, what happened? And I'd say, well, nothing. Wait, what do you mean, nothing? Well, all right, well, something happened, but nothing important happened. Well, you can tell this is not a good thing. So many, many years ago, I'm talking about we've been doing this for, oh, 25 years at least, is that during our day, if something happens that we just learn about or something fun happens or something funny happens or something that wasn't good happens, but, but anything that happens that, that is kind of noteworthy, we take a card out and, and, and we write what it is. We just make a little note to ourselves. Now, this is huge. 25 years ago, I made a commitment that if something happened that was noteworthy, I would not tell anybody about it until I told Margaret first. Because what happens is if you tell a dozen people what happened during the day, something, by the time you get home, it's old hat. The first time, you've got all kind of energy. Isn't that true? And it's, oh, my goodness, guess what just happened? Now, you know what's interesting is what that means is not every day, but most days, I've got a caller in the middle of the day. Because something just happened, and i got to tell somebody. You follow me? And I call, I said, Mark, 60 seconds, just guess what did. You know, boy, you're kidding me. Oh, okay, we laugh, hang out. Now, I tell others, you have no idea what that's done to cultivate our relationship. She knows that she's not the last person in the food chain to hear. She does the same for me, by the way. Number three, friendship. Obviously, to cultivate a relationship, there needs to be a friendship. Uh, Samuel Johnson remarked, if a man does not make new acquaintances as he advances through life, he will soon find himself left alone. A man, sir, should keep his friendship in constant repair. That goes for old friendships as well as new ones. I think we sometimes take for granted the people closest to us, and as a result, we neglect to try being good friends to them first. Number four is memories. To cultivate relationships, you want to create memories. I really work hard on this because here's what I believe. Here's what I believe about your children. I believe that your children won't remember what you bought them at Christmas time 20 years from now. Maybe they remember a key bike when they were 10 years old. They, they remember three. But can I tell you something? You'll buy them hundreds of things and they'll remember three or four because people forget things. But people don't forget memories. The experiences you do together are more important than anything else. And so I determined a long time ago to become a maker of memories. 
And I literally, every month, work on two or three things that I believe will create memories for maybe somebody I work with, perhaps somebody, maybe, maybe for Margaret, maybe for my kids. But I'm always working on memories. Because here's what I know. If we do something together, we experience something together, they'll never forget those experiences. My kids, when we lived in San Diego, we were away from most of our family, which was back east. So Margaret and I determined when our children were very small that we would go up to a little place about, I don't know, about 45 minutes from our house called Lawrence Welk Village. And, and it had a little, little golf course and swimming pools and a place where you could fish and just all this stuff. And we decided that we would, we would go and, and we'd get a little place there, a little timeshare there, and every year we'd go back to that same place. I was, uh, the other day I was back, uh, and we were going up to Los Angeles to play golf, and I was with my son-in-law, Steve Miller. And when we passed the village, Steve, you know, I, I didn't say anything about it. Steve said, let me tell you something. He said, every time we pass this village, your daughter Elizabeth, my wife, goes back into length of telling me all the things that she's done there. Well, she's not forgotten them. To, to cultivate a relationship, create memories. Number five, growth. To cultivate a relationship, there has to be growth. Benjamin Franklin said, promise may get friends, but it is performance that keeps them. When you begin any relationship, it is filled with promise, but you have to find ways to keep it fresh and strong so that it continues to have potential and not just good memories. One way to do that is to grow together. Make your growth intentional with your best friend. Number six, spoiling each other. Just practice spoiling each other. Voltaire wrote, if the first law of friendship is that it has to be cultivated, the second law is to be indulgent when the first law has been neglected. Just spoil Spoil your friends. Do just wonderful things for them. People principle number 18. People principle number 18 is the 101% principle. The 101% principle says, find the 1% that we agree on and give it 100% of our effort. Daryl Zadig says, if two men on the same job agree all the time, then one is useless. If they disagree all the time, then both are useless. And the question I must ask myself is, can I find common ground, and will I give it 100% of my effort? Now, when do I practice this 101% principle? It is an incredible tool in anyone's relational toolbox. However, it's not something that can be pulled out and used all the time. I say that because this principle takes a big commitment of time, energy, and thinking. Therefore, before practicing this principle, you need to ask yourself some questions. I'm, I'm a, I, I, I know that this, I'm a little vulnerable when I start helping you ask these questions, but, but this principle takes such time and effort, you have to ask these questions. Number one, is the person worth the commitment? Every person has great worth, but they don't all have the same relational worth to you. So you have to ask yourself, where do I use this 101% principle? Where do I find that 1% we agree on and give it 100% of my effort? Because there's a lot of things we're disagreeing on. Well, I have family, inner circle people, but you can't give 100% commitment to 1% you agree on with everybody. So you have to kind of evaluate, who do, I, who do I do this with? Number two, is the situation worth the commitment? A lot of situations, you don't have to do this 101% principle at all because it's just going to pass. It's just, it's just here, and it's going to pass whether you give it a commitment or not. Number three, is the issue worth the commitment? What is the issue? Is the issue worth you giving 100% of your commitment? And number four, is the return worth the commitment. So let's talk about this 101% return. Practicing the 101% principle can benefit you in many ways here are six. One, it allows you to build a foundation for change. Why? Very simple. 
change always begins on common ground. Just recently, I was um, in Washington, D.C., and I was spending a, a day with the CIA. They, they're going through a lot of changes, and so they said, John, we'd like to have you meet with 14 top leaders and have a long lunch, but then we would like you to talk to address about five or 600 of our people that are kind of leading departments about all the changes we're going through and, and how leaders view change and how they handle change. And so it was a wonderful, wonderful time. But what I shared with them that day, I share with you. When change must occur, there's a temptation for us to look at differences. Well, if I change, this is going to be different and this will be different. And, then, and what happens is differences tend to separate us. And what we do is when we want to see change accomplished, the first thing we want to do is we want to find common ground. What do we all agree on? Let's start there. Let's start on, on something that we can, you know, let's find the 1% we agree on and let's give it 100% of our effort. That's, that, that's the beginning of a successful change. A lot of times change never occurs because we find the 1% we disagree on and we give it 100% of our effort. Number two. It prevents unnecessary conflict. This 101% principle really eliminates a lot of conflict. General Grant said, there never was a time, in my opinion, some way could not be found to prevent the drawing of a sword. Number three, it reduces the odds of making enemies. Emerson observed, he who has a thousand friends has not a friend to spare, while he who has one enemy will meet him everywhere. Number four, it keeps something of value that could have been lost. When you practice this 101% principle, you really get to keep those things that you value and those people you value. In the paragraph in your notes, how many potentially rewarding relationships have you missed because you focused on the differences instead of the common ground? How many potential friends have slipped through your fingers? How many productive business associations have been forfeited? Former New York Yankees manager Joe McCartney observed, any manager who can't get along with a 400 hitter is crazy. Number five, it helps you to feel good about your part of the relationship. The reason it helps you and I feel good about our part of the relationship is because we know we're doing our very best. I'm right now personally going through a, an issue in a relationship that is extremely difficult, pretty much I've got bad news for somebody that I care a lot about. And the only thing that gives me strength in this whole process, the only thing that gives me peace in this process is I know without question that I've given this effort 100%. I mean, I have not slighted it in any way. I've, I've done my very best to make it work. Now, what I'm saying is when you have done your very best to make it work, it doesn't always work. Isn't that true? We've all come up to the place where 100% wasn't enough. But when I walk away from a situation that doesn't work out good, and I know with integrity that I've given it my best shot and that my motives have been right and my effort has been total, I can walk away. Disappointed? Yes but not devalued because I gave that individual the very best that I could. Number six, one more thing about the 100% principle. It enables you to make the best of difficult situations. The happiest people don't necessarily have the best of everything, they just make the best of everything. Adopting the 101% principle makes the best of every relational opportunity and no one can be expected to do more than that. People principle number 19. 
the patience principle. The patience principle says the journey with others is slower than the journey alone. For the friendship of two, the patience of one is necessary. And the question that I must ask myself is, do I take others with me even when it's inconvenient? By the way, when I, when I wrote this relationship book, I can tell you, sometimes when people look at an author, they think that the author writes those things which he or she really is good at. When I write, I have to have about four or five timeouts. Kind of like, excuse me, I'm writing this because I know it's true, not because I'm good at this. In fact, when I wrote the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, six of the 21 laws I don't do well at all. In fact, I would rate myself average or lower than average. Six of them. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I know I have to have a team around me. Are you with me? Because I'm not good at them. In fact, if you think you're good at all of them, you need a therapist around you. You need a real friend that cares for you because you're in deep weeds. Well, it's also true about these relationship rules. And this one here, this patience principle, this whole issue of, of, of taking people on the journey, you have to understand, I, I flunk this. Okay? I'm not a patient person. When I was in school, what I hated more than anything else about school was review day where the teacher would say, now tomorrow... We're going to review our notes for the last six weeks because we're getting ready for a big test, and we'll review the notes so we can get ready for the test. And I'd raise my hand and say, do I have to come? And she'd say, of course you have to come. Why wouldn't you come? Because I took notes the first time. <laughs> Excuse me? If I got it, do I have to come? And they always made me come. And I hated it. I'd say, here I am, sitting in the classroom, did my stuff on the front end. Now I'm waiting for everybody on the back end. <laughs> hit the ball and drag Charlie. Hit the ball and drag Charlie. Hit the ball and drag Charlie. After a while, don't you just want to hit Charlie? <laughs> this has been a hard one for me to learn. One of my leadership lessons is I learned about what leadership is, is I learned that leaders aren't the first to cross the finish line. They may be the fastest, but they reduce their speed so everybody else can cross the finish line with them. What leaders do and what leaders know is that the very fact that you're a leader is that you bring people with you. That's where the patience principle comes in. In your notes, I constantly cast vision for the people in my organization and then I left them behind. Not a good thing for a leader. I had to learn to connect with people and develop patience. These are two critical steps in relationship building. Patience without connection and the relationship lacks energy. Connection without patience and the relationship lacks potential. Connection with patience, the relationship has energy and potential. And if you want relationships to last, you need both energy and potential. So how do you become more patient in relationships? Number one, prioritize patience as a virtue worthy of developing. In fact, Aristotle said, the greatest virtues are those which are most useful to other persons. Nothing is more useful to other persons than patience. Number two, understand that it takes time to build good relationships. Number three, practice the exchange principle. We've already talked about that. Instead of putting others in their place, what do we say? Put yourself in their place. To develop patience, you need to appreciate other people, how they think, be sensitive to how they feel. Every person thinks his problems are the biggest, his jokes are the funniest, his prayers should get special attention, his situation is different, his victories are the most exemplary, and his faults should be overlooked. That's just how we are. 
Number four, realize that people have and create problems. When it comes to people, there are good news and there's bad news. The good news is that some people in your life are going to be the source of your greatest joy. And the bad news is those, that those same people may be the cause of your greatest problem. That's true not only at home, but also at work. And the higher you climb in leadership, the more difficult the problems. The findings of leadership experts Warren Bennis and Bert Nannis bear this out. They state, what we have found is that the higher the rank, the more interpersonal and human the undertaking. Our top executives spend roughly 90% of their time with others and virtually the same amount of time concerned with the messiness of people problems. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Number five, identify areas where people need patience with you. Oh, my goodness. Now, this has helped me a lot. I'll pass this on to you because it's amusing to me, but it's really helped me a lot. Because I have a problem with patience with others. One of the things I have done is I have gone to people who love me the most, my inner circle, and I've asked them to give me ways that they have to be patient with me. It's very embarrassing. First of all, they always readily say, oh, yeah, we'll be glad to do that. That in itself tells a lot. In fact, what really bothers me is when they say, you need it in five minutes? In other words, they're not grappling <laughs> with ways to think of how they have to be patient with me. They've got a list already. In fact, the other day I asked Linda for this lesson. I said, Linda, I mean, you know, you, you're my assistant. You run my whole life. What, what areas do you have to be patient with me in? She just started rattling them off. I said, oh, not so fast. <laughs> Shouldn't we think about some of these? And... <laughs> she didn't think about it. She, she said, Here's just part of her list. I am constantly losing my glasses, my cell phones, my pens. And then she finally just says, John, you lose everything. If you've had it, you've lost it. <laughs> if you find it, you'll lose it again. I have probably 30 pair of glasses. I have them everywhere. My, my answer to losing glasses is put them everywhere. So when you come through my house, you'll, 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 you go through my house, well, Margaret probably going to pick them up today because company's coming. That's always disgusting, too, because then I can't find them again. <laughs> but if she, if she just leaves them where they should be, you'll count a dozen, 15 pair yourself. Because it's just kind of like if you lose them, then don't carry them. Just wherever you sit, have some. <laughs> then she, she, I mean, she goes, I mean, this list doesn't, I mean, she just, she said, John, any time we're discussing planning, you want lots of options. That's very true. I like options. You don't know anybody likes options as much as me. So when you say, we're going to do it this way, I, I will say, well, are there seven other ways that we could do this too? Because you just never know when you need an option. Do you realize how much time it takes for her to give me all of the options I want in life? In fact, she's been with me now for several years, and now she'll proudly say, John, I, before, before we go through this, there are five options here for you. And she gets very proud, and then I'll find another one or two that I want. She said, I'm constantly changing my travel plans. Well, I do that. You just never know where opportunity's going to be. All of a sudden, opportunity's over there, so you've got to go over there. I overschedule myself, and as a result, projects take longer than the time allotted. I hate to say no. Oh, my goodness. This morning, I had a request from some university, and I put yes, and then I scratched it out and said, well, no. And then I wrote a note and said, well, maybe. <laughs> and I handed it to her. <laughs> take care of that. Take care of that. 
Another one, I, she said, I want her to be, to be able to call her 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's part of the requirement of my sister to be, have the cell phone on 24-7. So I stopped right now, pushed one button, she'd answer. Kate takes it to bed with her, that's it all the time. I try not to awaken her much, <laughs> but you just never know. <laughs> now, this list can go on and on. And when I looked at that, I thought, I'm a terrible person. But you know what that helps me do? Helps me be patient with the rest of my people. Because what I'm really realizing is I have a bunch of idiosyncrasies, and my team has to put up with those all the time. Number six, recognize that all relationships have give-ups, give-ins, and give-and-takes. That's a fact. If you're in a relationship, you're going to have to give up some things, you're going to have to give in on some things, and you're going to certainly have to do the give and take. All okay, thank you. I think that was, uh, that was good on patience, especially. I was just writing down. I think that's a good way to find out how others need to be patient with us, and then we can extend the same thing to others in our team. Okay, so just um, uh, this goes on to say that, um, you know, that relationship takes time, relationship takes effort, and uh, it's our responsibility to nurture relationships. Yes, this is a very important aspect of it because we can be uh, really focused on uh, I mean, it's an important area that we, I mean, in the sense that we need to focus on goals. We need to focus on uh, accomplishing goals uh, because that is, you know, that is something very, very important. Uh, we need to focus on uh, on the vision and everything. And uh, we need to focus on sharpening our skills, uh, et cetera, that will you know, take us there and, and put in efforts to do that. Um, but this is a very important area because in, in all that we are doing, it involves people and uh, and you're not you know you're not making that journey alone, but all of us are uh, making that journey uh, you know as a, as a body and uh, in professional setups, in uh, family, in uh, you know ministry uh, setup, so where we interact with people, where we lead people and work with people. Right, so these are some important things. Okay, we'll stop here, and then we'll uh, we'll continue next week. Okay, God bless. Have a great weekend. Uh, we'll catch up next week. Bye bye. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Right. Bye. bye. Thank you, Pastor. I say, God bless.